All right, I get it. No one's throwing a party out there when they're seeing a road work sign in the street. And I've seen the majority of the construction memes out there, so I have a pretty good idea of what you all probably think about construction. And though there are some projects out there where some of us say, wow, that came up really fast, I think people tend to only remember those projects that just drag on forever as it continues to impede on the public's day-to-day -day life, and rightfully so. So as a construction engineer myself, on behalf of the hardworking moral contractors out there, I will give you, the excited YouTube audience, the clarity that you deserve on why in the world these construction projects take so long and go over budget. And at the end of this video, I hope you are relatively convinced that there is a method to our madness and we're really trying to operate as efficiently as we can. So if you're ready to go, let's hit that like button to show that we're ready to invite construction into our hearts. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to this channel if you want to see this do from Hawaii. Talk more about topics like this, it'll mean a lot to me. And with that out of the way, here are four reasons why construction projects tend to take a little bit longer and go over budget. So number one, in construction there's a lot of unforeseen conditions. Construction is not exactly a black and white business and there are surprises that just pop up along the way. Unforeseen conditions tend to cause construction delays and incur costs because there's going to be a fix or some sort of new scope of work that's going to need to be determined along with the pricing of that work. So sir, what's an unforeseen condition? I'll give you two examples. So say you're doing some work in the streets, similar to the Hawaii Rail Project where we need to build these columns that hold up the actual rail guideway. In order for the columns to stand up, you're going to need to dig the foundation, which means that you're going to need to break ground. So anytime you're digging underground, you'll tend to rely on something called as-built drawings. So what this is are drawings that are made in the past by previous contractors that tell you where exactly they put their things in the ground. These are notoriously unreliable. And there are so many stories that I hear of someone checking the as-built drawings and then actually toning and scanning to see where all the utilities are going to be to verify the as-builts. And boom, they find a utility line that wasn't shown on the as-builts. So what do you do from there? You have to find out whose line it is. <laughs> whose line is it anyway? You have to know if it's an active line and if you're going to need to relocate it. And this is a process that may take weeks or even months. So that's why if you're driving around and maybe you see the same hole in the ground, could be a reason why. So going back to our column for our rail system, say they're trying to put the column in a certain location, but they find that there's an active sewer line running through that area. So the decision makers on the job need to make a call. Are you going to relocate the active sewer line that may affect people in the surrounding area? Or are you going to pay the engineer to maybe redesign this guideway and move the column 10 feet over? And this decision will usually end up coming down to cost. But unforeseen conditions don't only happen in the streets. It could even happen in your own home renovation. So say you wanted to demo one of the walls down so that you could open up your kitchen. And in the process of you demoing that wall, you find that maybe the electrical is outdated or maybe you found mold in the wall. And usually during that time, the contractor will tell you, do you want me to take care of this now or do you want to just cover it up and deal with it later? And just a pro tip, it's always better for you to deal with it now. The cost will be way worse later on in almost any situation. But I can definitely see how a homeowner may feel like the contractor just always has their hand out for more money. But us as contractors, we can't price unforeseen conditions into the work. If we priced all that risk into our bid, we'd never get the job because our price would be too high. So I tried to explain it to people like this. Say you're going out for your job interview and you're planning on being there an hour early. But as you're driving down there, maybe 10 minutes before, there's an accident on the road. So you get stuck in traffic, the freeway's closed, and you're late to your interview. Now you plan to be an hour early, but you ended up late. Do you really want the company that's interviewing you to judge you based on that unforeseen condition? Probably not. So there's a balance to this whole unforeseen condition thing as well too. There will be contractors out there that are kind of immoral and try to take advantage of the situation by saying that a lot of these conditions are unforeseen, but they really should know better as professionals. That's, and that's why it's also important to have a contractor that you trust. And once you gain that trust with them, don't screw with them. And you can always keep watching this channel to see how you can vet out these bad contractors. In the real world and maybe in your renovations, unforeseen conditions should be clearly defined in your contract and how to deal with it. So just keep that in mind as you're going through that process. So number two, there's a lot of changes in construction that can affect schedule and cost. 
So like the unforeseen conditions would be considered a change. But changes aren't only related to unforeseen conditions, it can be driven by maybe the owner or designer of the project. And sometimes a lot of these changes are driven by incomplete documents at the time of bidding to the contractors. And it's not necessarily a fault of the designer or maybe even the owner, it just might just be a timing thing. But if you have incomplete documents at the time of bidding, it makes it really tough for the contractor to know what you really wanna build. And that forces the contractor to make some assumptions on what the build is going to be, which may not be in line with what the owner and designers want. And that's where you can get into issues with cost and schedule. So like in our rail column example, where you're either moving the active line around or you're moving the column over, maybe it's decided by the owner that they don't want to deal with the active sewer line. So they want to go through the process of redesigning the rail line so that you can move that column, you know, 10 to 15 feet over. But that rail piece is already prefabricated and you can't just lengthen the concrete element. So you're going to have to recast a new thing, get all the rebar for it, get all the steel for the rail track. So all of that adds cost. And it really depends on how the construction contract is written. But a lot of these construction changes are not supposed to be implemented in the field until the pricing is approved. And that's why I can go through this whole negotiation process, which really delays the work in the field. And that forces the contractor to sometimes make a business decision. Out of the goodness of the relationship with the owner of the project, do you want to just move ahead with these changes before pricing is approved and kind of operate at your own risk? Or do you want to likely follow the contract language that says that you shouldn't be doing anything until the pricing is approved? And that's why it depends on project to project and the relationship with the owner and designers of the job. But I will say this, I have been on projects where the owners of the project have just verbally, we did some handshake deals, tried to get the changes approved, we did it in the field, and then at the end of the day, when we tried to get paid for the work, they told us, well, if we knew it was going to cost that much, we wouldn't have told you to do it. So at that point, the work's already done. I mean, what are you gonna do as the contractor? But that's a business decision that we made based upon the relationship that we thought we had. So that's why a lot of times, especially if you're doing like government work and things like that, you're forced to go by the book on some of these things. And that's why when you're waiting for that whole pricing process to go through, it just delays the project. And as the project gets delayed, you have to pay all the people on the construction team staff. So it's just kind of a lose money situation altogether. And with changes, you don't only have to worry about pricing, but maybe just the procurement or gathering of all the materials. Simple changes on the job can have a big impact. So say you're doing your renovation project and you wanna switch from a vinyl floor to tile. One, the material can be more expensive, and two, the labor could be a lot more intensive when you're doing a tile floor. If the vinyl is just a glue down system, you know, you're just gluing it down to the substrate, but with tile, you have to put the thin set down, you have to grout all the joints, so it may be a little bit more labor intensive. And maybe the tile that you want is coming from a different country that's gonna take maybe four more weeks to get here. And that's not even mentioning the trickle down effect of maybe the tile being thicker than the vinyl flooring, which means that all the doors that you're trying to procure for the job may have to be cut down a little bit. All your transitions between your different floorings may be screwed up by this material change. So even just the smallest changes in construction can have a domino effect which ends up incurring costs and inevitably schedule. And if you have a really good working relationship with the owner, as a contractor, you really wanna to try to make this happen for the owner of the project. You wanna to try to roll with the punches and just make it happen for your client. But it is a wrench that gets thrown in the process and it's not always as easy as just making it happen. So number three, public perception. As much as us as contractors would like to build in a bubble without any acknowledgement about who we're building around in our surroundings, that's just not the reality of construction and we really need to care about who our neighbors are. By golly, the things we could accomplish if we didn't have to worry about public perception. All these roadway projects, we could just shut down the whole freeway and get the job done in a couple months. But could you really shut down your main freeway for two months and force all that traffic into the residential streets? Probably not, right? So say we have to do shifts or night work where you have to continuously set up and break down every day or maybe even set up lights on the side of the road if you're working at night. And that's really for the betterment of society as a whole, but the reality is we could be so much more efficient as contractors if we just did our own thing uninterrupted. And that's not to even mention noise. I mean, who doesn't want to be woken up to the sweet sound of hammering and backup alarms at seven in the morning? And that's why when work is being done in residential areas, we're limited to the amount of hours we can work based on the surrounding people which totally makes sense, but it's just extra obstacles that us as contractors have to deal with 
in order to execute the project. Because at the end of the day, us as contractors, we're not building for ourselves, we're building for the betterment of society. So we can't be pissing off the whole public for the operation that is really meant for them. We could just be a lot more efficient if we just operated like a little more selfishly, I guess. And number four, planning. As with anything in life, when you fail to plan, you plan to fail. So as contractors, we aren't always perfect and actually more often than not, we're not perfect. And a lot of the issues that happen in the field and may cause delays, a lot of times boils down to lack of planning. So like for example, you can take these construction fails videos on YouTube. The crux of these issues can boil down to a lack of planning and foresight on how these situations should be handled. But planning does not only affect the inefficiencies in the field, but planning can also go all the way back to kind of what we we're talking about earlier when the job is going out for bid. If the project documents that the contractor is bidding are not complete or well thought out, that'll lead to a lot of issues down the line when we actually try to build this thing. And sometimes it's out of the control of the owner and designers, and sometimes these projects are just pushed out prematurely just based upon some kind of financial burden. And just for regular homeowners, I hear a lot of stories where you know the contractor doesn't show up on time, or they don't show up when they say they're going to show up. And you can tell that the contractor is just doing this part time, they're not planning their manpower. And really that just boils down to pre-planning and communication with the homeowner and making sure that everyone's on the same page. And on all projects, planning cannot just be done by one party, whether it be the owner, designer, or contractor. It really is a team effort and the best projects are when everyone is on the same page and planning together. Well, those are to me the top four reasons of why construction projects don't finish on time and go over budget. Now, I'm not saying that contractors are not the reason why any of this happens. It's just that sometimes there's more than meets the eye in all of these situations. Construction really is a tough business. And when I see projects that go over budget and go over schedule, it's not only one party that's at fault. It's usually a collective effort from the team and hopefully everyone can band together to get the project done and moving in the right direction. So if you have any further questions on this topic or maybe you disagree with anything that I said, feel free to comment below. I would love to hear from you guys. And as always, if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe and hit the notification bell so you can join our growing family here on YouTube. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate your time and I'll see you in the next video.